morning to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we'll be reading verses 17 to 21. And uh, this will be number five in our series on uh, what we've been calling the What Is series or the basic doctrines of the Christian faith, the essentials of the Christian faith. And so we've looked at what is the Bible, who is God, what is life. Um, and uh, now we're looking at uh, what is salvation this morning. A question that we should all know, perhaps we do know, but uh, it's good to recall these things, uh, a little bit of a refresher for us. Um, perhaps if we are engaged in conversations with others, it's, no, it, it's good for us to know the issues, the, back, uh, the, the things that we need to, to, to um, set before people as we consider something as important as what is salvation. And for this we want to read our scripture background reading, 2 Corinthians 5, starting at verse 17 to 21. The Apostle Paul writes these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And before you close your Bibles, let's look at verse 21 again. If there is no other verse that you know in the Bible... If there's no other verse that I would uh, more strongly recommend that you memorize, it's 2 Corinthians 5.21. The whole of the gospel is encapsulated in just that one verse. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. With these words in mind, let us turn in our hymnals to number 71. I waited for the Lord most high. Let's rise to sing the four stanzas. Um, why don't we sing stanza three a cappella if that's okay.
Congregation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, if you um, have been following the news and following the events that have been happening in the world, you'll know that uh, a leader of ISIS, he recently announced a shortcut to paradise or a shortcut to salvation for Muslims. And he, made, he issued this statement. He said to uh, those uh, Muslims who are, were listening to him, he said this statement. This is a quote from what he said. The best acts that bring you closer to jihad, so, um, or the, the best acts that bring you closer to God are jihad, he says. So hurry to it and make sure you carry out this invasion, this holy month, and be exposed to martyrdom in it. Now, need to explain some terms here. Uh, for Muslims, the word jihad uh, is an act of war against anyone who is not a Muslim, anyone the Muslims consider an infidel, uh, especially Christians and Jews. Uh, the holy month that this uh, leader is talking about is the month of uh, what they call Ramadan. It's a month of fasting, which is sacred to Muslims, and martyrdom is dying for Allah, and which, uh, according to Muslim teaching, guarantees your immediate entrance into paradise, into heaven, and great rewards. And this leader announced that there is no better time to kill the infidels and for martyrdom to die for Allah than the, during the holy month of Ramadan. In other words, if you would have salvation, if you would be saved, then this is what you need to do. You need to go out there and you need to kill these infidels, especially during the, this holy month of Ramadan. And that announcement, as you may know, resulted in 38 tourists being shot to death on a beach in Tunisia and the shooter himself being killed. Uh, and this is just one of the examples of the horrific atrocities that are committed every day by these deluded fanatics. It has been reported as well that thousands of youth from all over the world, even North America, are running off away from their parents to join ISIS, attracted to the do something for God, put your faith into practice kinds of teachings that are being propagated. And when it comes down to it, Islam really teaches two things. Salvation by life, that is by living a good life, follow, following their five pillars, or salvation by death, that is martyrdom. Well, in contrast to these and other misguided belief, beliefs that we have in the world, we want to look this morning at what the Bible teaches. We want to look at Christianity's answer to the question, what must I do to be saved? In, Christ, in Christianity, we speak, of course, of being saved, or we speak of salvation. And they basically mean the same thing. And it refers to, to the fact that we are, well, salvation refers to the fact that we are rescued from something that threatens our very life. When we, if we're in mortal danger and we're rescued from it, that is being saved or salvation. Years ago, for instance, just to give you an example, my wife was uh, picked up by her co-workers as a joke and she was tossed into the deep end of a swimming pool which was all very funny for a, a few seconds until they realized that my wife cannot swim. And I had to remember having to plunge in, fully clothed, and together with a few others, we pulled her to safety. Left alone, she most certainly would have drowned and died that day. Salvation, in a sense, is like that. By the way, Martha has a better story. Uh, she should ask her about it, about salvation. Uh, salvation, in a sense, is like that. It means to be rescued it means to be snatched up. It means to be pulled out of a situation that would certainly end in great calamity for us. And the greatest calamity is to st for human beings is to stand before the just judge of all the earth who is a holy God, guilty of your sins. And that appearance before the judgment seat of God would result in only one verdict. That is eternal death, eternal damnation in hell. And so the question which goes without saying, but we'll say it anyway, the question of what is salvation is a question of critical and absolute importance. This morning, as we look at the fifth in our series then, we want to summarize what we're teaching here with this theme. The church confesses what we believe about salvation. The church confesses what we believe about salvation. We'll see in the first place our need and in the second place, God's provision. But as we, members of the church, confess what we believe about salvation, we see in the first place our need for salvation. And in a nutshell, to summarize everything that we're going to say, here's why we need salvation. Because we are hopelessly sinful and under the just wrath of a holy God. In fact, in our passage, we learn that sin has so damaged our relationship with God that there needs to be a reconciliation. And the Greek verb translated reconcile means to uh, enact a change of attitude. 
Paul uses the word to describe the restored relationship between a husband and wife in uh, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 11, where he cautions wives, this is Christian wives, not to be separated from their unconverted husbands. And he says to them, if you do, you must then remain unmarried or else be reconciled to your husband. That is, you must restore the harmony that you had. You must repair the brokenness. The same word, translated reconcile or reconciliation, is used in Ephesians 2 verse 16 to describe what Christ has done to change the relationship between Jew and Gentile. He has brought both together, uniting them in their common need for a Savior. Whereas before, the Gentiles were despised as being outsiders, they were called the, the uncircumcised. Uh, now, they are fellow citizens and members of God's house together with Jews who believe. And so Jews and Gentile sinners are now reconciled in Christ. But, uh, and for those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, of course. But Paul also uses the word to describe the transformation of the relationship between God and sinful man. And he speaks of uh, God having reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ in verse 18, as we heard. He has, in other words, he has restored the broken relationship. He has closed the gap that stood between us. Whereas before there was enmity, now there is peace. Where before there was anger, now there is forgiveness. There is love between us and our Creator. But again, why was there a need for God to do this, to bring about reconciliation, to enact reconciliation before us? Well, simply again, because of our sin. Sin has caused a breach. It has caused a separation between us and our Creator. God said to Israel through the prophet Isaiah, and this is in Isaiah 59, verse 2, your iniquities, your sins, have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you. But then when we get to the New Testament, especially Romans 3, we're taught that this does not apply only to Old Testament Israel, but to all of mankind. We learn in Romans 5 that it is while we were all still sinners, still God's enemies, that Christ died for us. And so this teaches um, or, or um, applies to us all. Sin has made us enemies of a holy God. Proverbs 20 verse 9 asks, Who can say? I have kept my heart clean. I am pure from my sin. And so all men are guilty. But then we must ask a further question. What, what is sin exactly? We, we, uh, we say, yeah, well, God is angry with us because of our sin. He has had to reconcile us to himself because of our sin. What exactly is sin? Well, there is no one clear definition given in the Bible as such. Perhaps the closest we come is uh, 1 John 3 verse 4. 1 John 3, verse 4, where John says, sin is lawlessness. And that gives us a good picture of what sin is. It reminds us that sin is really a violation of what God has clearly commanded. It is an act of rebellion of mankind against our Creator. Uh, sin carries with it serious consequences. So Jesus said in Matthew 5:19, whoever breaks one of the least of God's commandments and teaches men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, God's commandments uh, or his law also carry with them the standard of absolute perfection. It's all or nothing. James writes in chapter 2, verse 10, whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. And so it carries with it the standard of absolute perfection. Old Testament Hebrew terms describe sin as missing the mark, falling short of the target. It's translated as transgression, which is a crossing of boundaries that God has set in place, or iniquities, which refer to um, doing to God what he does not deserve. Words like wickedness, evil, perverseness, even violence are used to describe sin. It's described as walking in darkness, blindness, uh, deafness, death, stony hearts. All of these are pictures that are used to describe sin in the Bible. But where does this come from? Well, the Bible teaches that sin is inherited. Uh, Romans 5 verse 12 tells us that through one man, that is Adam, sin entered the world and death through sin. And so David could speak in Psalm 51 of being conceived in sin. We're all born with hearts that are already polluted and we're born carrying the guilt of our father Adam from the Garden of Eden. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 15 verse 11, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, 
murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. And so they come from the human heart. Uh, corrupted thoughts, words, and deeds spring forth from corrupted hearts. Across the road from my house is a pond, as you, some of you might know. And on some days in the summer, it's the most beautiful thing you can see. But there are many other days when it develops a scummy, frothy film on its surface. And you're quickly reminded that what can sometimes appear to be pretty is really an algae-infested water hole. And that's just the nature of a pond. But human nature is also like that as well. Natural man can have moments when he appears to be good and praiseworthy, but, but on the inside, he's a corrupted, infected, contaminated wellspring of evil. And that's why we could never achieve perfect righteousness before God. The prophet Isaiah says in chapter 64, verse 6, that we all are like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. Our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. And you see, the problem is, with most people, is that we don't see ourselves as being that sinful. Even we, as God's people, can listen to these explanations, and what happens? We think of other people. We think of how this applies to other people. And we say we hope so-and-so is listening. I've been hearing this past week about the crime wave that has been hitting this area with people stealing quads and gas and generators and, and high-speed chases and whatnot. And uh, it reminded me, and I was uh, uh, saying to someone, uh, how much I despise thieves, uh, that a thief is wor worse than a murderer. And, and there's a sense in which a thief ought to be despised They've earned it, and they certainly deserve to be caught and to be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. But when we put ourselves into the context of humankind and as we st all stand before God, you know, it's good to remember that uh, which of us is really better? Which of us has not stolen from, a from God, from our neighbor, what we owe to them? Even something like as simple as devotion and reverence to God that God uh, it requires from us. And, and has a right to. We steal that. We keep that back uh, from God. Or respecting another human being. Uh, that's a, a form of stealing where we hold back what that person is due. Um, listen to, to Romans chapter 2, verses 21 to 23. And this is Paul speaking to the, to the Jews. Um, in chapter, uh, uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 21 and following, he writes, You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? And you see, the Bible doesn't let us off the hook as easy as we would ourselves. And we have to remember uh, what Jesus said in Matthew 5 when he clarified that sinning, breaking God's law is not confined to the outward deed. We sin in our thoughts, our words, even our attitudes. And so it's very easy to see our need for salvation when we are honest about our sin. It calls for some honest self-reflection, looking honestly at ourselves. And then we be, in light of God's law, and then we begin to see how sinful we are and how great is our need. You know, just to... To, to look at ourselves honestly, and sometimes that's hard, we have to admit, but to look at ourselves and see, for instance, as we think back on the past week, how easily irritated we get when things don't go as we planned, how annoyed we can get with our spouse, with our children, with our co-workers, and our employees, or how annoyed we get, how irritated we get around certain people. When we think about how uh, of how courteous or how obedient we were to the laws of the land as we drove on the highways and roads where we let our eyes and our minds wander in this past week. Boys and girls, do you think you could have moved a little bit faster this past week when mom told you to get ready to, for bed? Did mom have to raise her voice before you let your brother have a turn on the trampoline? Do we lie sometimes? Do we tell a story in, a, in such a way that it makes us look good and the other person look bad? Did we, um, did we want something that someone else has because we think we deserve it, we should have it? Do we sometimes say words that must make Jesus sad? These are all sins. 
Maybe as a teenager, you find yourself questioning certain things that you have been taught in your upbringing. Or you find yourself inwardly rebelling, even though maybe you haven't actually said the words yet, but you can, if you look at yourself honestly and you look at your heart, you, you find this inward rebelling against God. You see this already happening in your life as a teenager. And, and today, um, it, it's become especially difficult with the pressures that are on you because you're being raised in a home where mom and dad say, no, no, we don't do that on Sundays, perhaps. We don't do these kinds of things. We don't go to these kinds of places. We don't engage in these kinds of activities. And you have a whole bunch of other uh, kids whose parents or even their church say, sure, no problem. And we're not going to get into, to, into specifics this morning about these things. That's for another time, perhaps. All we want to see for now is that that rebellion that you feel in your heart the objections that arise in your hearts, the desires and the discontent that we feel as young people, as adults even, that, that, uh, de those desires and that discontent that seem to say, why can't I do what I want? If I'm not hurting anyone, what is wrong with doing this? Why should I be restricted from doing what everyone else is doing just because I'm being raised in the church or I'm a member of the church? These are all evidences of our rebellious sinful nature. And if we continue to break God's commandments all through our lives and live in rebellion against Him, we will die in our sins and we will perish eternally. And that's why when we speak of salvation, we first need to speak of our need because we have to be reminded that we are all guilty of sin against God. But thankfully, that's not all we speak about. As we, members of the church, confess what we believe about salvation, we see in the second place God's provision. And it's important to begin on this note. Salvation is of the Lord. Human beings need saving. We cannot save ourselves. If we will be saved, we need the Lord to save us. We need a Savior. And here's the good news. In spite of our corruption, in spite of our constant inclination to all evil in spite of our natural rebellion against God he is merciful and he has provided the Savior that we needed Jesus Christ the divine Son of God as we heard in verse 18 now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ we're reminded here that it was God who took the initiative it was he who made the step toward us in mercy when we let's be honest would have been quite content to remain the enemy of God. Paul reminds us in verse 19 of the gospel message that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. And the word trespasses refer to a deliberate act of sinning against God, a deliberate act of rebellion against God. Our sinful nature causes us to disobey him, to disregard his holiness, and to be blind to his good gifts. We create idols so that we begin to credit our lives with our own, our, our own hard work, our own ambitions, our own attitude. We say things like, oh, at least we think it. I'm a self-made man, a self-made person. I am what I am today because I worked really hard and I put my shoulder to the wheel and my nose to the grindstone and whatever. And you know, the Lord would be within his right when we think about it that way. If the Lord blesses us with all that we need and blesses us so richly and we, then we in turn say, by the work of my hands I have done this, the Lord would, would be within his right to leave us in our sin and to eternally, eternally punish us when we die. But the amazing thing is he doesn't do that. Through Jesus Christ, he will not hold our sins against us. He will not charge us with our sins. He releases us from our debt to him. That is, uh, what, that's what meant when uh, Paul speaks of not imputing their trespasses to them. He releases, God releases us from our debt to him. And that's not to say that God then ignores our sin or just turns a blind eye to our sins. That's not, that's not what it means. Uh, remember, God is a holy God. And a holy God cannot let sin go unpunished. The penalty must be paid. There must be consequences for our rebellion. What is owed must be collected. But here's the amazing good news of Christianity that we bring to the world and that we find joy and assurance in and that we must bring to these fanatics 
and these uh, people who follow false religions and philosophies. Here's the good news. God punished Jesus on the cross for our sins. Verse 20, 21 clarifies how he did that. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And Jesus is described here as the one who had no sin. He had no debt to pay. His heart was pure. His life was undefiled. But on the cross, God took our sins and he placed them upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus was made to be sin. That is, he was made to bear the consequences of our sin upon himself. Christ was our substitute. He stood in our place on the cross. He received what we should have received. Our passage reminds us that Jesus fulfilled what was prophesied of him in the Old Testament, in Isaiah 53, verses 5 to 6. Speaking of Jesus being our substitute. Isaiah 53, verses 5 to 6. But he, that is Jesus, was wounded for our transgressions. The uh, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stri stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, both the New Testament and the Old Testament make it clear that all human beings are sinners and our sins are against a holy God who is absolutely intolerant of sin. And so even our best efforts will fail because they are stained with sin, rendering them unaccept unacceptable in His sight. But again, here's the good news. God has provided one who is acceptable. Jesus Christ the righteous, Peter calls Him. And he has borne, that has carried our sins upon himself and he has received the sentence of our sin and through his receiving that sentence, through his suffering and death, he has pacified or quieted God's wrath against us. The Bible calls that, by the way, the atonement. Atonement includes two things, substitution and satisfaction. Jesus fulfilled both. Jesus was our substitute in that he took our punishment upon himself in our place. And the satisfaction is that he quieted God's wrath. He took upon himself and he paid sin's penalty by giving his life for our life. And so there's substitution and satisfaction. And he fulfilled all righteousness for us by taking our punishment upon himself. And that's why, as much as the world would like us to, we can never say as Christians, as, as Christians who truly understand what the Bible teaches, what Christianity is, what the gospel is, as Christians we can never say with the rest of the world, it doesn't really matter what religion you practice, it doesn't really matter what you believe once you believe something. We can never say that. Jesus is the only Savior. And he can, own, he can be the only Savior. He is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. As much as people might think that they can somehow make it up to God by trying to live a good life, giving charity, trying to good, do, do good deeds, without a proper understanding of how sinful we are, they're really living in a fool's paradise. Romans 2 verse 5 tells us, in fact, that we are storing up God's wrath against ourselves throughout our lives. We keep adding to our debt every day. And so we cannot earn salvation, not by our good works, which are stained with sin, not through anything good that we do, including church membership, and certainly not by murdering others and, and false martyrdom. We must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We must put no trust in what we can do, or who we are, or even how hard we intend to try. Paul himself, perhaps the greatest Christian who li ever lived, in Philippians 3, thinking back on all his credentials, his lineage, his efforts, his zeal, he counted it all rubbish. And his one goal in life, he says, was to be found in Christ, realizing that he had no righteousness of his own. And he saw, as we heard in our passage, his calling now to implore all men to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Now perhaps you sit here this morning and you say, you know, that's all good and all, maybe all true, but I, I don't really need to think about those kinds of things right now. I don't need to consider, I don't need to think about salvation. I'm young, 
I used to think, think the same foolish thing when I was young, uh, younger as well, too. I have to live my life. I have to have some fun. And I'll think about these things when I'm older. Here's the problem with that. No one but God knows how long we have on this earth. Today might even be our last day on this earth. Instead, the author of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1, says to us, Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth. The Holy Spirit says to us all in Hebrews 3, verse 7, Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. This is the day of salvation. Today is a day we must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because congregation, Jesus Christ is the only guarantee of forgiveness of sins and reconciliation with God. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And the promise is that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for the Gospel. Thank You that Christ has come, removing the dividing wall, and reconciling us to you through his blood, through his sacrifice. Thank you for the gospel message that has been sounded in our ears. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. There is no other savior, no other way, no other path to life, to eternal life, to the forgiveness of sins or reconciliation with you, but through Jesus Christ. Help us to cling to him, to believe in him, to announce him, to proclaim him, to never be ashamed of him, to love him, with all our hearts every day and to live for him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Number three hundred